Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, first may I thank you for your kind remarks, which are more than my due, but I thank you particularly because it's more agreeable to receive more than one's due than one's due. <laughs> Secondly, may I come to the subject of this lecture. It is the impact of Marx on the 19th century. Um, we are met really to celebrate the first international. It's difficult to think of a body of men more obscure than those who constituted the first international. Nobody would be more surprised, I think, on the whole, than these men gathered in London in 1864, if they thought that 100 years after this momentous event, they were still being remembered. I doubt whether anyone now attaches very much meaning to the names of Schapa and Plessner, Ecarius and Hermann Junge, Duple, Limousin and Bobczynski. These, I admit, are the obscurest names of those. There are a few more famous names, as Monsieur Varla and Tolin, who were made famous by the Commune, and perhaps a few better known names than that. Major Luigi Wolf, none of them are persons of world significance. Nevertheless, there is no doubt that the First International began something which altered our lives in the end. And the reason for this, of course, is, as I need hardly tell you, that in spite of the influence in the International of the thoughts of thinkers like um, Proudhon and Bakunin, in spite of the presence of neo-Jacobins and Blanquists of various sorts, what really made the International a significant affair was the presence in it of Karl Marx. He was no doubt thought of by these worthy men in London as a learned German, better drafting manifestos than most of the honest working men who were gathered together for this purpose, from England, from France and Belgium. A man, on the whole, better educated than they were, a fiery radical and revolutionary, somewhat intimidating, but useful for this particular purpose. In the end, of course, he transformed it into an instrument of his own will and influence. The number of Marxists in the First International was perhaps not greater than the number of Bolsheviks in the Socialist Parties of Russia in 1917. Nevertheless, the effect is much the same. That is to say, they won. The if the question is asked about the impact of the movement of, of, of Marxism, in particular of Marxist ideas, um, in the 19th century, and I must say unashamedly that it appears to me that it is Marxist personality and Marxist ideas which played this decisive part. It's not a very Marxist attitude, perhaps, not a very Marxist point of view, but I must admit that I think it is the force of his personality and the content of the ideas which he pumped into this not very receptive audience that in the end produced an effect in the world. If you ask what these ideas are, there are at least two classes of ideas with which I don't propose to deal. The first is the general effect of Marx's ideas on the cultural and intellectual life of Europe. This is an important and interesting subject, insufficiently investigated, but it is something to write about rather than to talk about, because the only way of doing this in a valuable manner is by detailed research, minute description of detail, and not by a few broad generalizations. I mean the influence of Marx on the thought of sociologists like Weber and Pareto, the influence of Marx on historians who, um, both ancient and modern, who began to apply his particular theories of the class struggle across a very wide canvas, his impression upon um, thinker, philosophers of various types, for example, upon oh, thinkers like the um, young Pareto and the young Croce towards the end of the 19th century, his, the impact which he made upon almost every humane discipline and particularly, of course, historical and humane, particularly humane disciplines, because his effect upon the natural sciences, at any rate in the 19th century, um, appears to me to be zero. Um, if, this particular effect is, of course, of importance and mo became more or less fulfilled, so to speak, by the time we reached the end of the 19th century, which I, which I would place in 1914. That is to say, all the Marxist histories, all the uh, political thought that is influenced by Marx, the historical and sociological thought, the many branches of human learning into which Marxism penetrated in our own day appear to me to be the extensions without any significant or original advance of the kind of influence which he already had had by 1914. I don't propose to deal with this, important though it is, because as I say, I think it needs detailed treatment. The second um, topic with which I don't intend to deal is uh, the various chemical compounds of Marxism with other doctrines, with anarchism, 
with populism, with syndicalism, which produced all the various Marxist and para-Marxist parties towards the end of the 19th century. All those um, um, possibilists and alemanists in France, populists in Russia, the particular um, combinations of, for example, the impact of Marxism upon the populism of a thinker like Mikhailovsky in Russia, the particular modifications which Marxism went through in the minds of such popularizers of his doctrines as Prekhanov and his friends, the effect which it had in Italy, the effect, although it was rather feeble, which it had in the United States and in England. This again is a broad and important subject, but should not be dealt with with a few broad brushstrokes. I propose to confine myself, if I may, to something more familiar, namely, to what appear to me to be the major uh, ideas which Marx, so to speak, put across, and with which he affected his audiences and ultimately the world. I don't propose to this audience to spell out the familiar structure of Marxist thought. I propose to concentrate only upon what appears to me to be the most arresting and original of his ideas, those which have had the deepest effect until this day. And these appear to me to be two in number, with modifications, implications, variations upon them. The first is his monism, the fact that he believed that all things, both nature and history, both man and objects, can ultimately be explained in terms of one vast, single, hypothesis, one systematic doctrine which accounts for everything there is. That is the first. And this had, of course, extremely powerful political implications in the form in which he gave it. The second is the division of the world into the children of light and children of darkness, which in all kinds of peculiar implications which he certainly can't have supposed, can't have thought of in his own lifetime, also had an extremely violent, sometimes beneficent, more often devastating effect upon posterity. Let me begin with the first. When Plekhanov came to write about the philosophy of history, he called it on the monistic interpretation of history. It's true that he chose this title, which appeared long and cumbrous, in order to avoid um, the perils of the Russian censorship. What he really wanted was to give it a far more violent title. Nevertheless, what he said was perfectly true. A central stand in Marxist theory is his monism. By monism, I mean that he supposes that it is possible to construct a theory compounded in equal parts of what he at any rate regarded as natural science, of understanding of history and of messianism, which accounts for all there is. The other thinkers have had similar ideas from the beginnings of philosophy onwards. In particular, in the 19th century, of course, Saint-Simonists embarked upon this, and still more strongly, the positivists led by Auguste Comte. What is, why, one may ask, did positivism, which made equally ambitious claims, not produce the powerful impact of Marxism? One of the reasons, at any rate, of, for, for this, well, two of the reasons for this are, uh, it seems to me, are these. First of all, that Marx stressed much more strongly than ever Comte did the, what might be called, the happy ending element of his theory. The fact that his doctrine accounted not merely for the conflicts, the miseries, the servitude and slavery of men hitherto, but also used these very servitudes and slaveries and miseries as evidences of the coming felicity of mankind one day. The fact that one and the same doctrine accounted both for misfortunes, for the decayed state in which humanity found itself, in particular for the condition of exploitation and suffering, in which large number of human beings found themselves. The same doctrine also demonstrated this state of affairs was bound to end in the triumph of a particular class and in the triumph of certain humane principles was a certainly a stronger mixture than anything which was provided by anyone else outside the churches in his time. The second reason is that unlike Comte, he didn't simply enunciate that anyone who understood his ideas or followed his doctrines uh, would, by applying them to real life, be able to implement the particular consequences to which that implementation was supposed to lead. He did something which was strategically much more effective, that is to say, he identified an already existing class of men, the workers, industrial workers, more broadly the poor, in, in, to put it very broadly indeed, with the people who would inherit the earth. That is to say, he attached his particular doctrine to an already existing army, 
and made of them the particular chosen instrument of history. And this, so to speak, was a move of the highest strategic significance. He found a body of men in existence, and all he provided them with a Bible and with leadership. This certainly didn't enter into Auguste Comte's calculations. And to this extent, it, this is certainly one of the reasons for the greater impact and success of Marxism. It's over rival doctrines flourishing at the same time. Now, let me go back, if I may, to the two cardinal ideas which I enunciated. First of all, this question of monism. Marx, like a great many thinkers before him, begins from the proposition that all true questions have answers. One true answer and all the other answers being false. And that this true answer can be discovered. And that when it is discovered, it can be implemented. And that this true answer, if it is implemented, will, so to speak, both in theory and in practice, satisfy the cravings of the human mind and the human heart. He has starts from the assumption that there is such a thing as a human nature. That there is something central to all men in virtue of which they are called men. That part of this nature is to need certain things. In material terms, food, clothing, shelter, security, and so forth. In spiritual terms, perhaps, a certain degree of opportunity for self-expression. That, given that there is this human nature, there is a certain normal state of affairs in which this nature is realized, and an abnormal state of affairs in which this nature is not realized. All this he laid down with a certain degree of dogmatism, as indeed previous thinkers, particularly Hegel, but previous thinkers as well, had done before him, from Plato and Aristotle onwards. The the assumption here is that the normal condition of man is the satisfaction of his desires in a harmonious manner. And the assumption that all men's desires can be satisfied in a harmonious manner compatibly with the harmonious satisfaction of all other men's desires. That there is some situation in which all men can obtain that for the sake of which they were made or, as Marx would put it, anyhow, that so to speak, which so to speak, their natures require or need that the abnormal situation is a situation of struggle or strife or conflict. Now, this means, roughly speaking, that he, if, if Marxism is accepted as a doctrine, you deny the other interpretation of politics. You deny the interpretation of politics in accordance with which many men in different circumstances have different desires. These desires conflict both between bodies of men and between different periods and perhaps within a single man himself. That the task of any practical discipline, say politics, say economics, is the adjustment of these interests so they don't collide too violently. That the state of both of the individual and of society is one of constantly imperfect equilibrium. That all that politics can do is to prevent the pot from boiling over, so to speak. But that the notion that there is one state of affairs in which all the little balls roll into all the little holes, so to speak. There is one pattern, one that life is a kind of jigsaw puzzle, and that if you find, um, so to speak, uh, the solution to all the scattered parts which lie about and fit them into their proper pattern, then there is a final solution into which everything fits, after which there is no need, so to speak, to do anything further. Humanity marches on, the gates of paradise open, and some kind of guaranteed felicity begins. The, uh, Marxist notion certainly belongs to the group of theories which deny the view which, for example, I don't know, Burke and liberal thinkers in general propagated, namely that ends conflict with each other, that there is a permanent state of uh, friction between them, and that all that men can do is, as I say, to try and hold these things in balance and prevent the desires of one man, one class, one group, one nation from destroying or frustrating the desires of other men, other classes, other nations. According to the Marxist theory, there is, as I say, a fixed human nature with certain discoverable human desires. If there weren't such a thing as a fixed human nature, it would not make sense to talk about people as being degraded, or people as being dehumanized, or people being perverted from their proper ends. It is only if you grant that there are certain ends of man which men as such are bound to pursue, that you can say that men are prevented from pursuing them, or that human nature has somehow been twisted out of its proper direction. The question now arises, how do we discover these ends? I'm putting this in a highly simplified form because I haven't too much time at my disposal. I hope therefore to be forgiven for this. The only way in which this can be discovered, according to Marx, is by certain persons, not by everyone everywhere, but by persons in a certain privileged situation. Who are these persons? On the assumption, that history, as I needn't rehearse to you, 
is the history of class struggles, which, as he rightly says, was discovered not by him, but by the bourgeois historians already before his time. At any given moment, there must presumably be one body of persons, a class economically defined, which is progressive as against other class or classes which are not. Those who understand their position in the world, who understand what class they belong to, what the historical position of this class is, what the needs of the class are, these people and they alone understand what it is that will satisfy the particular cravings or desires of the class which is progressive. Progressive because it, the satisfaction of its desires is the satisfaction of those general human needs which the particular historical moment generates. Those who understand the position are in the best position to know what in particular will, so to speak, advance humanity forward. You identify a particular class with the general future of mankind at any given moment. It was the bourgeoisie in the 17th century, but it is the proletariat in the 19th. You then say, what will in fact advance humanity? Why, that which will satisfy its most progressive section in those respects in which historically it is capable of being satisfied. Who can know this? Those persons who are in some way aware of the nature of the historical process and who are not blind to what goes on. Who are not blind? Those are not blind whose interests don't blind them to the facts. And who are these persons? Well, it, if you belong to a class which is about to be eliminated by history, that is to say, if you belong to a class of persons which in the particular dialectic of historical movement is condemned by history, as Marx would say, is uh, bound to yield to uh, some other body of men whose interests are more consonant with what the times require, roughly speaking, who belong to a class which does not belong to this progressive class, then you are systematically unable to face the facts. Because um, no human beings can face too much reality, but it is particularly difficult to face it if, whenever you look around you in the world, you observe that everything is, if you are honest with yourself, everything is a symptom of or evidence for the coming destruction of the particular body of men to which you belong. Therefore, only one body of persons is in a position to detect what is the progressive, so to speak, thing to do, what will in fact advance humanity, namely persons who belong to a class in whose interest, so to speak, it is to know the truth as it really is. It not being in the direct interest of anyone else, because people on the whole are not uh, so made that they can watch their own impending doom without any degree of indifference. Now, let me explain to you, um, so to speak, what so to speak, this comes to. Let me explain to you the second uh, notion which enters into Marx's monism, which, I, which I, hope, I hope I've said enough about, namely his doctrine of the unity of theory and practice. I think this is of importance because I think it affected the movement and I think it made of the socialist movement which Marx inspired the particular marching army which in fact it became in all its transformations. The unity of theory and practice, which is probably familiar to most people here, and I, I must admit that I'm ashamed of talking about this to persons whose lives were spent in far closer association with these things than mine ever was. Nevertheless, I think I must make an attempt to explain what I mean. The unity of theory and practice is something different from that which it is sometimes made out to be. It is customary in textbooks on Marx to say, and it is an error which I myself have come near, come near to making in the past, to say, that fundamentally the Marxist attitude is one of a kind of crude cosmic utilitarianism. What I mean is this. You say to yourself, I have certain desires which I wish to implement. I'm a practical person. I want to do certain things. I wish to express myself. I wish to make, be happy. I wish to be well fed. I wish to acquire power. I have certain desires. How can I realize them? Why? I can only realize them by understanding what the world is like. What the causal structure of the universe is, what consequences follow from what causes, what kind of material will yield to what kind of treatment. In other words, I must study history, I must study society, I must study the material in which I deal, namely if I'm a politician, societies, if I'm a sculptor, marble, if I'm an economist, the economic system and so forth. Now, if, in fact, the Marxist analysis of history is correct, if, let us assume, history is best explained by the collision of classes economically determined, however that is done, then in order to implement my wishes, I must study which way the world is going. Every, any, every man wishes, his wish, wishes to fulfill that which he desires. In order to fulfill it, I must understand 
the direction in which the world is proceeding. If I do not understand this, I may fall foul of it. I must understand reality, in other words, because if I don't understand reality or how to deal with it, it will get me in the end, to put it very crudely. This is a juggernaut theory. This is a straight juggernaut theory of Marxism. Better find out where things are going, because if we don't find out, you'll pay for it. I, Marx, say that this is, uh, there is a class struggle. If, we don't, if, you ignore, if you ignore these facts, you will, in fact, be crushed by, by, by the facts that you don't understand it. You, you would better find out which way the world is going. You might as well um, understand what it is that is inevitable and try and like it. Because if you don't like it, it will come in any case. Therefore, since you can't get what you want, you would better try and uh, want that which alone you can get. Something of this kind. This is a very common interpretation of Marxist views a common interpretation which makes him a kind of crude utilitarian realist. You want to satisfy your wishes, study the, the world in which you live, be realistic, don't uh, indulge in fantasies, don't be an idealist, don't believe in myths, um, unmask things, um, penetrate the veil which surrounds reality, understand that the economic laws which are said to be eternal are in fact not eternal but made by men, understand the processes of politics which are but men trying to make history for certain motives and certain circumstances because if we don't understand it then you will in fact be destroyed by it. Better get onto the bandwagon if we don't want to be crushed by it. This is the, what might be called as I say, a kind of cosmic utilitarianism. This I believe to be a false interpretation of Marx and a very shallow one. This, a great many political thinkers have enunciated this particular principle. And it's a very, common, it's a, it's a very normal thing to think, so to speak. It's, a, it's a, the ordinary sense of the word realism, in which when people say, I'm afraid I'm rather a realist, what they mean is, I'm about to tell a lie or do something rather shabby. <laughs> there is a, the, the assumption being that reality is on the whole disagreeable and had better be studied in its least attractive aspects if you want to get things done. This, I believe, to be a falsification of Marxism. The unity of theory of practice is both more complicated and more interesting than this. It comes to something of this kind, if I may just expound it for a moment. The assumption, uh, previous, assumptions, uh, previous assumption was that it is possible to contemplate reality as a body of facts without any, if you like, emotional predisposition towards them. That it is possible to be dispassionate. That it is possible to be a scientist who simply describes the universe without taking up any particular attitude towards it. Wertfreiheit. Freedom from valuation. For those who follow the philosophy of Hegel, and it's certainly uh, important to remember that, he, that Karl Marx, in spite of all his deviations from the master, in spite of all his translations into materialist terms, remained uh, profoundly within the Hegelian orbit, perhaps even until the end of his life. For those who follow this particular view, this is a false interpretation of how men live and think and will and feel. It is a more correct thing to say that I look at the universe with a particular set of eyes. I observe the, what might be called the process of life. I observe this process of life not indifferently, but with certain desires, with certain feelings. I am a willing creature, I am a feeling creature, and I am an active creature. Above all, I am engaged in a constant process of action, constant process of trying to dominate my environment in order to acquire freedom over it. Constant desire not to be dominated by it, to be independent, to be able to impose myself upon the matter around me, whether persons or things, in order not to be dragged about by them. That is the natural desire of human nature. That is the craving towards freedom which these philosophers of this school attribute to human beings. If I do this, then I look upon reality, so to speak, uh, with certain eyes. I see everything in the light of those wishes, desires, ambitions, feelings, that particular set of volitional and emotional characteristics without which I cannot be. And that is a brute fact. I am what I am. Men are what they are. They have the desires they have. They have certain basic desires or basic ideals, if you like, or basic cravings in terms of which human beings are defined as such. If they didn't have them, they wouldn't be human at all. Since I am that, I can't look upon reality with different eyes. Therefore, it is false, it is, a, it is a fallacious thing to divide values from facts. The view of a man who is, so to speak, uh, starving upon food is very different from the view of a man who is satisfied. The view of, uh, upon life of a soldier is clearly different from the view of life of a bank clerk or a lion tamer or anyone you wish to take. Um, 
Human beings don't choose the particular form of life into which they are born. Above all, they don't choose the class into which they are born, and they don't choose a particular moment of class struggle out of which, for Marx, history is to a large degree compounded. Therefore, I, I look upon reality with certain class-conditioned eyes. The pretense that I can be impartial, that I can be detached, that I can have, be free of values, that I can be a cold, remote scientist, simply noting and describing reality without taking, any, um, uh, taking up any attitude towards it, is a profound piece of self-deception. If I think that I can do this, it is only because for some reason, some pathological or natural reason, I don't wish to be involved in this particular reality. It's a form of withdrawal, if you like a form of cowardice. At any rate, it is taking up a certain sort of attitude. Detachment is a form of flight. Detachment is itself it taking up an attitude, though it may not be the same attitude as that of an active participant. To say that I stand on the edges of facts and merely describe, I'm a mere observer, the word mere is quite important there because it means that is the part I choose to play. But I always choose to play a part. The notion that I can choose to play no part, that I can merely observe, merely record, merely describe, is for thinkers of this school impossible. Therefore, to say about a man that he is fully objective, or that he is fully detached, or that he is completely passionless, is not false, but meaningless. There is no human situation about which such a description, to which such a description could conceivably fit. This is the doctrine of the theory of the unity of, uh, this is the uh, theory of the um, unity of theory and practice. That is the doctrine. The doctrine is that whatever I do or don't do, whether I contemplate or act, I'm always in a state of activity towards something. I'm always striving for something or running away for something, failing to do something or doing something, and failing is also a kind of doing. Sitting still is also a kind of doing. That being so, it's false to say with Hume and other thinkers that values can be distinguished from facts. That on the one hand, there is a certain description of the world. On the other hand, there is a taking up of a certain attitude towards it, favorable or unfavorable. Any kind of conscious activity already involves me in some kind of evaluation. That being so, the two processes are one. Thinking is action. Action is thinking. These things are aspects of one activity and not distinguishable from one another, except for purely technical purposes, purely philosophical purposes. Now, if you really think that, then it's clear that if you enunciate a political doctrine, for example, there is a class struggle, or that it is desirable for the proletariat to form a political party, or that it is important in the particular uh, political or economic situation in which, say, the workers of a given country um, are situated uh, to either to uh, form a political party, to seize power or not to seize power, to collaborate or not to collaborate. To say these things is not simply to give tips to people about how to gain certain subjective ends. To enunciate a theory of history is not simply to say, I am among the many people who simply explain to you how theory moves. Some people explain about matter, they are called physicists. I explain about history, I am a philosopher of history. In both these cases, we are just scientists performing a certain scientific task of describing how things are. We are not recommending, we are not advising, we are not urging, we are merely dispassionately describing. This is not a possible situation. What, whatever I say and whatever I do, any theory which I enunciate is itself an invitation to, to a certain form of life. Because the theory which I enunciate is itself bound by myriad threads to a particular way of looking at things, to possessing certain kinds of eyes which for Marx are class conditioned. They might have been conditioned by something else. He happens to believe the strongest single factor in molding human beings, in influencing both their action and their thought, is the particular position of the class to which they cannot help belonging in the particular concatenation of forces, the particular conflict, the particular relationship which classes are in at any given moment of history. Therefore, uh, what Marx sought to give to his followers is not simply a theory of history with uh, a kind of take it or leave it attitude. Here, this is how history moves. If you want to be a success, uh, you will apply my theory. Like a man who says, this is how one builds a bridge. You needn't build a bridge, but if you want to build a bridge, this is how to build it. This is not the attitude. What Marx conveyed to his followers is a total attitude to life. Moral, aesthetic, political, economic, social, scientific, the, 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 the ambition certainly was to provide a total answer. Because in the view of Hegelians and Marxists, one can't stop at any particular uh, discipline, one can't stop at any particular frontier. Each involves the rest. 
any kind of interpretation of experience is itself a symptom of or an element in a particular attitude to, the, to, to, to society, to myself, to other human beings, to things. Um, and therefore, to be conscious of what I am, and the only way in which I can become free and dominate my environment is, of course, if I understand it, is to spell out these particular relationships. This, in this respect, Marx is vastly superior, even from a political or tactical point of view, from, say, such rivals of his as, say, someone like Auguste Comte or, or liberal reformers or, or um, uh, even to, to a certain extent the Christian socialists of his time who attracted men's, ambition, men's loyalties also, because he really did construct a kind of anti-church. The only other institutions which gave a complete answer to the problems of life were, of course, the religious establishments, the churches. There is a certain sense in which it is just to say that Marx was the first person, consciously and deliberately, to construct a secular anti-church. Kant tried to do this too, to a certain extent, and his followers certainly tried to construct something called a positivist church. But Marx succeeded better, partly because he was a profounder thinker, but also because he happened to identify the cause of human progress. That is to say, the particular path along which a just appreciation of the facts would lead any sane or rational person with an already existing body of men who were being beaten into shape, as he supposed, by the industrial process. That is to say, he identified his particular movement with an already existing army which was being disciplined into some kind of unity by the fact that they worked in factories, by the fact that they worked in, in, in army, by the members of armies and so forth. In a certain sense, you could say that Marx was horrified by the same phenomena as had disgusted and horrified and embittered a great many sensitive men of his time. There was a general sense of the vast anthill of the 19th century, those huge anthills of beehives in which human beings were clamped together and degraded and dehumanized, in which their individuality was taken away from them and they were, in, so to speak, knocked into some kind of impersonal association with, with each other in vast factories, in armies, in bureaucracies, in other huge impersonal bodies, in which the old, an older life, in which a greater degree of freedom was given to the individual personality and to the relations between human beings in families or in the particular social groupings, which say the, the feudal ages or the middle ages possessed, was, were being knocked down in favor of these vast nameless herds. But whereas uh, people like Schopenhauer and Nietzsche were very conscious of it, or uh, Ruskin, or Tolstoy, or Dostoevsky, most of the sensitive persons of the 19th century escaped into all kinds of other attitudes, such as either mild liberal reformism, or is desire to be saved by some kind of by art, by escape into some kind of individual aesthetic satisfaction, or uh, general despair, or various forms of private religions and private mystiques. Marx was virtually the only person who tried to convert the very vices of his age into guarantees of future virtues, who tried to make out that these dreadful phenomena which were going on around him were not only inevitable, but necessary stages in the advance of man towards freedom, towards justice, towards plenty, towards happiness. In other words, these very phenomena were not merely to be condemned, but to be seen as inevitable miseries en route to splendors, so to speak. And this is the meaning of, so to speak, the famous phrase about the fact, about his famous doctrine, to the effect that it is the capitalists themselves who, whether they know it or not, are by the very nature of the industrial process, disciplining huge armies of workers into competence, efficiency, technical knowledge which would enable them, the workers, then to get rid of their oppressors far more easily than if they had remained ignorant, unindustrialized craftsmen. So that it is an ambitious attempt to turn vices into virtues, so to speak. At any rate, to make enormous virtues out of obvious necessities. And this, of course, is a cause of great strength to a movement. Now, let me come to the second central idea, which it appears to me Marx um, enunciated. And this, I think, is of the two perhaps more important. And that is this. In all previous human thought, whenever there was, let us say, disagreement about the truth, there was a certain assumption on the part of human beings that any man could, in principle, understand any other man. It might be difficult, but it was worth trying. If I was a Catholic and believed a certain kind of truth, and there was before me a Protestant heretic, I tried to convince him of the truth of my doctrine and the falsity of his. The assumption being that we had certain common values in terms of which it was possible for me to communicate with him. 
the whole purpose of philosophy, theology, any intellectual discipline at all, was to try and convert somebody, to my point of view, on the assumption that we're both adequately rational creatures, or if I was a rational creature and the other was not rational, I could at least educate him into rationality. Perhaps he was badly educated. Perhaps his thought was obstructed by passion. Perhaps his thought was obstructed by ignorance. I could try and remove these things. I could teach him, I could educate him, I could place him in situations where the truth would shine upon him and he would really see it. If I couldn't persuade him, if I couldn't get him to see my point of view by persuasion, which is one of the arts of politics, in extreme cases, violence might have to be applied. But even the theory of torture, even the theory of the, Inqui Inqui of, of the Inquisition, say, in the Catholic Church, the general theory of coercion, at least in theory, was based upon the assumption that all I was trying to do was to make the other person understand. If the devil had possession of him and blocked his vision, I tried to unblock it by somewhat violent means. If I, I felt, felt that he was a man in danger of losing eternal salvation, I took steps in order to procure it for him in his interest. But throughout, uh, at any rate, I was since bound to him by some kind of common assumptions. He was a human being, I was a human being. We had enough in common to make it possible to communicate. The whole theory of persecution was founded upon the possibility of communication, provided these rather terrible obstacles could somehow be liquidated. Now, Marx, I think, perhaps I'm, I'm, this is an exaggeration, it appears to me that Marx was the first thinker really to destroy this assumption in a very formidable and, from the point of view of our lives, very far-reaching way. If his doctrine is correct, if a man thinks as he thinks, because he belongs to the class to which he belongs, if, in other words, certain classes, the existence of certain classes, that is their relationships to the system of production, in some way conditions human beings to look upon the world in a certain way, to approve of some things, disapprove of others, think certain thoughts, see things in a certain light, in which they can't help seeing them because the interest of their class is bound up with that particular way of acting, thinking, willing, and so on, if that is so. Then, supposing you belong to a decaying class and I belong to an advancing class, it is impossible for me to communicate with you directly because you are, as it were, conditioned by the forces of history into systematically misinterpreting experience to your advantage. Now, I, who am, so to speak, progressing, can afford to look the truth in the face, because whatever happens is grist to my mill, because my class is going to come out on top. You, who are declining, cannot afford to look at reality in the face, and therefore systematically misinterpret it as a kind of form of unconscious comfort. You generate the opium with which, in some sense, you, so to speak, uh, uh, put yourself to sleep. You, uh, this, is, this is the whole doctrine, so to speak, of rationalizations, of myths, of, of ideology, by which a class which, so to speak, whose interest is bound up with some situation which is fundamentally unsatisfactory is bound to disguise this fact both from itself and from others and can deceive both itself and others by all kinds of myths and inventions which cloud the truth, from, which, which becloud the truth, which keep it from it, because they can't quite dare to look at it. Let me try and give you three metaphors which I've thought of in order to make this present to your imaginations. The first metaphor which I've thought of using is that of an es two escalators, two systems of moving stairs. If, I go, I'm on, I, if I'm on the upward moving stairs, my vision is totally different from yours who are on the downward moving stairs. And fundamentally, there can't be communication between us because what you see is different from what I see. People who move downwards have a different vista before them from people who move upwards. And there isn't enough in common to make direct communication possible. Or let me take a second metaphor. Supposing you are somebody who is drowning, you are in no condition, if I ask you about the temperature of the water, this is not, so to speak, the moment to ask you that question, nor are you in a condition to be able to give me a reliable answer to this particular question. Because your attention is otherwise engaged. You are a, you are a class about to be destroyed, and therefore you are desperately clinging to every kind of straw which is going to give you f the false hopes about ultimately being rescued. Of course, these hopes are false, but you can't help, uh, you can't help entertaining them. Let me try my third metaphor upon you. It, the relation for Marx of, as it were, um, the enlightened, that is to say the person who understands uh, the historical situation and therefore has transferred himself to the uh, right, either is born into the correct class or by his own act of will has transferred himself to it. Because individuals, of course, can move from one class to another. The entire classes cannot be converted uh, into the machinery of history. 
the metaphor there is that of a psychiatrist and his patient. If I am the psychiatrist, I understand myself and I understand the madman. If I'm the madman, I understand neither the psychiatrist nor myself. If I ask the madman questions, it isn't in order to find out the state of affairs. It's only in order to find out his symptoms, to find out what particular pathological condition he may be in. And I have to find this out, not merely for the humane reason that I'm trying to cure him, which I may or may not be trying to do, but because the madman may be armed and may in fact do me damage. And therefore I must protect myself against him. This is somewhat the attitude of the Soviet Union, certainly in the 30s, towards the Western world, where they saw themselves as understanding the machinery of history, whereas those with whom they were dealing did not. And therefore they had to protect themselves against these lunatics. It's exactly the attitude of a speak, psychiatrist to, um, to a lunatic. This is the position of a man who understands to a man who doesn't understand. But the implication is this. If it is really the case that there is no communication, because there is a whole class of persons, as it were, blinded by history to the implications of their true position, although individuals may see, the whole class cannot, if this is really to be taken seriously, then there is a whole class of human beings at any given moment who are doomed by history to disappear, in which case there is no point in talking to them, there is no point in arguing with them, there is no point in listening to them. They are, they, they, you can't talk to them, you can't try and save them, however kindly you may feel towards them, because they've been rendered deaf by history to your particular form of locution. And therefore, they are condemned. This is constantly occurs in the works of later Marxist writers. Since they are condemned, there is no point in try, wasting effort in trying to save them. It isn't that you take up a particular attitude of hatred towards them, or a particular attitude of enmity even, but they have been doomed by history, and the sooner they get off its stage, the better. Individuals may be rescued, but classes cannot. Now, you see, this, of course, in a sense, is an enormous advantage from the point of view of a party fighting to assert itself. Because it means you needn't bother about the enemy in a certain sense at all. You have to bother him because you don't wish to be defeated by him. He may still be too strong. But you needn't communicate with them. They're, they're out, of, out of your moral range because history has placed them there. Now, this division of human beings, this cutting of human beings into half, into sheep and goats, whereby the goats are forever goats and nothing can save them from being goats, is an enormous weapon both of belief and of propaganda. This division into mankind, so to speak, into the, res the about to be rescued and the unrescuable seems to me something new. Even the Jacobins, who presumably, uh, uh, let us say, um, put to death uh, aristocrats or priests because they belonged to the wrong class, allowed that in theory these men, if they changed their views and understood about uh, liberty, equality and fraternity, could all of them be integrated into the new state. There was no doctrine by which they were, as it were, conditioned into inability to understand and therefore were made automatically expendable. But this Marxism brought into the world. And ever since then, there have been doctrines of all kinds, non-Marxist doctrines as well, which have divided human beings into these two divisions, whereby one can, without any compunction, without any qualm, so to speak, execute the rest, remove the rest, because this is the only way in which humanity can advance. It's not simply a question of practically, practical convenience, or as in war, so to speak, we must defeat the enemy, otherwise we can't attain to the goal. We know that these people can't be rescued in any case, and therefore they might as well be dispatched with all the rapidity and all the humanity possible in order that history might shorten its birth pangs and human felicity come sooner than it otherwise will. And this, this of course, is a huge gives a huge impetus to a comparatively feeble and comparatively suffering class because it not only promises future felicity but represents the rest of the world as in a sense doomed, impotent, unable to resist, not worth thinking about. This seems to me the second central notion, so to speak, which um, Marx introduced into the world and this is something which all Marxist parties in some degree accepted or rather those which didn't accept, so to speak, only didn't accept at the price of a certain degree of inconsistency. Now, uh, if you, we come down to brass text, to actual facts, the fact that Marx believed this is extremely clear. When, for example, the statutes of the, of the First International War were created, and Marx obviously objected to words like universal human rights, or freedom and justice, or all the various cliches, uh, if you like liberal cliches, which Proudhonists or, or Blanquists uh, borrowed from the liberals, which was the normal stock in trade and the quite sincere stock in trade of 
um, radical parties, socialist parties, left-wing parties of all kinds and sorts. When he objected to these, it is normally assumed that he was simply objecting them on the grounds they'd become used-up liberal slogans. But this is not quite so. He objected to them because he genuinely thought that in the mouth of the proletariat, words like justice or words like rights meant something different from what they would mean in the mouth of other persons. And therefore the use indiscriminately of a language common with that of the bourgeoisie was a recognition of the existence of certain common values. And the whole point of his doctrine was a denial of just that. And that is why there is constant protest uh, on Marx's part against the use of expressions of this, time, this kind, which on the whole distressed and surprised his followers who saw no harm in them at all. That's why he writes to Engels at a fa famous moment in the f drafting of the First International, pointing out that he had allowed one or two of these expressions to come in, but he didn't think they would do very much harm. What he meant was that he had to make concessions because there were these foolish Proudhonists and there were these foolish Blanquists and there were all kinds of other foolish socialists and radicals in the party who wouldn't quite understand if one didn't talk about justice and about rights and about liberty and about all these other things which people were supposed to be struggling for. But himself certainly believed that these words acquired a quite different sense for a self-conscious proletarian from what they did to a bourgeois or member of some other class. This, I think, is symptomatic. In the case of the Gotha program, everyone remembers that he objected to the use, for example, of brotherhood of nations, saying nations cannot be brothers, because, in, so to speak, because, or, or brother, because nations and states are evil as such. Or when he objected to phrases such as equal rights, because he said until the economic base had changed, until there was a genuine cornucopia flowing, until there was plenty, there was no such thing as equal rights. Rights could only occur at the level of, uh, created by the economic system. The economic system determined everything else. And a right could only be what it was in virtue of the particular economic situation. So long as the class system persisted, so long as the society was uh, riven by class war, there could be no talk about equal rights because such a thing was a chimera and an impossibility. So that the whole of moral language, so to speak, if you like, was transferred to the eschatological stage after the revolution has been won, after the flow of production becomes wide and generous, after human beings have liberated themselves from these fearful chains which bind them now, after they've ceased uh, exploiting and persecuting each other and uh, together um, exploit inanimate nature. Until then, this such language couldn't be used. Now, the implication of this is serious and interesting, because if you ask yourself what it was that made various persons quail, that is to say what made various persons shy back from accepting the full implications of what Marxist socialism bound upon them from the days of the First International onwards, you will find that what makes them quail, what sets them back to a certain extent, is always the fact that they can't quite swallow the full implications of the fact that the moral values of my class are genuinely incompatible with the moral values of yours and we really oughtn't to use common terms except as a stratagem, except in a Machiavellian way. Um, I don't, the examples are obvious. You see, when you say what, for example, horrifies people about certain practices by people who profess Marxism, what horrifies them are not mistakes of tactics. What horrifies them is usually cruelty, brutality, Immorality of some sort. Now, what immorality means what? Uh, sin against what moral code? You will find that the moral code against which it's a sin is not the moral code which can be deduced by the rigid application of Marxism. And this is quite interesting. Let us begin with minor examples. When, for example, towards the end of the 19th century, the leader of the French Marxists, Jules Gued, refused to take part in the Dreyfus case because he said the Dreyfus case was simply a row of the bourgeois among themselves. A lot of capitalists fighting it out with other capitalists, nothing to do with us, nothing to do with the workers. Jaurès, who was perhaps not completely Marxist, but certainly regarded himself as a militant socialist, was shocked. So was Anatole France, who was afterwards regarded as a socialist, almost a communist, shocked. What were they shocked by? They were plainly shocked by the fact here was a case of blatant injustice. Here was a man falsely accused by the church, by the army, by right-wing persons and so forth in France of having done something simply because he was a Jew or simply because in some way, so to speak, he became a symbol of anti-clerical or liberal tendencies. He hadn't committed this particular crime and these people refused to take part on the narrow and perfectly defensible Marxist ground that we Marxists, we proletarians have our own scale of values and to take part in these other people's fights is in some way compromising. 
When in 1903, on the famous occasion of the, of the split between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, Pekhanov and after him Lenin said that if necessary for the sake of the revolution, elementary human rights might have to be uh, suspended. I mean, rights of what the Russians used to call inviolability of the personality. That is to say, the individual rights of not being, so to speak, done, uh, not being under, uh, cruelly treated, not, being, uh, not having one's physical freedom removed for no reason. When people were shocked by that, what, what was the scale of values in terms of which they were shocked? The scale of values was some kind of non-Marxist scale, because if you were a consistent Marxist, you said to yourself, here is the stream of history, here are two classes locked in mortal combat. What we must do, we the leaders of the progressive class, is to do whatever is going to accelerate the coming of the revolution. The coming of the revolution will only be brought nearer by the strengthening of our proletarian army. Anything which militates towards that end, we are at war. Anything which militates towards that end is good. Anything which goes against it is bad. In wartime, is, wartime is no time for uh, brooding over, uh, so to speak, uh, old-fashioned scruples. The worst which you can urge against such an attitude is, if provided you believe in the sincerity of the leaders of the proletariat, the worst you can urge is you've made a tactical mistake. This is not the way to bring about the revolution. You are doing something to weaken the proletariat, not to strengthen it. You are doing something to uh, destroy its power. You are doing something which is economically stupid, socially uh, retrogressive. But this is, has a very different quality of indignation about it from what is normally called moral indignation, which is conceived in terms of values which you assume most other human beings will understand and sympathize with. And this, so to speak, is theoretically inadmissible in the rigid Marxist schema. When in 1914, for example, both sides were shocked when the Second International proved impotent in the face of the coming of war. When both sides were shocked, but particularly, for example, when someone like Pekhanov wanted to defend the French or wanted to march against the Germans because he thought that European civilization was in danger. When La Salle gave Marx evidences of the fact that he thought a war between France and Prussia might endanger what he called European civilization, Marx, in one case, Lenin, in the other case, was suitably shocked as Marxists. There was no European civilization. There was their civilization and there was our civilization. The notion of a common civilization was already a concession to the enemy. It was a misunderstanding of the unity of theory and practice. When Lenin pointed out to Trotsky, I can't remember the building, the National Gallery in London or the British Museum, I can't remember which, and said this is the National Gallery. What he meant was literally that. Theirs means that of the bourgeoisie, that of the other side. Everything which is theirs is theirs, everything which is ours is ours, there can't be bridges. When Rosa Luxemburg was shocked by Lenin's dictatorial tactics, when in future, after years, people were shocked by Stalin's brutal behavior and so forth, all these shocks, if you ask what, what they were, particularly when they were moral shocks, about purges, about trials, about Russo-German pacts, or whatever it might be, when, for example, Martov talked about Lenin's boundless cynicism, what do you suppose he meant? I don't for a moment say, uh, wish to say whether I thought that Marta was right or wrong. That is comparatively irrelevant. But one knows, roughly speaking, what he meant. Now, when he accused Lenin of boundless cynicism, this is something quite different from accusing him of, let us say, um, making errors, making mistakes. Why shouldn't Lenin be boundlessly cynical if it was for the benefit of the proletariat? Boundless cynicism meant he broke his word, he betrayed party comrades, he altered his views without telling them, he rigged elections, he seized power by all kinds of irregular means. Well, what of it? If you could demonstrate that this weakened the workers' movement, if you could show that this may put the revolution further off, then of course you had the right to protest. But you only had the right to protest as you protest against the commander-in-chief of an army who is not being competent. This is, so to speak, that your indignation should, strictly speaking, be confined to that. Obviously what Martov meant and what people who um, object to Stalin's practices meant was the trampling on certain of what they assumed to be common human values. And the existence of these common human values is to some extent a permanent thorn in the flesh of actual Marxist thought because it keeps obtruding at points at which the theory is not supposed to admit it. This famous division of sheep and goats by which what they, the goats, think is really irrelevant to us is constantly being broken into. I mean, that is what is, what is interesting, so to speak. It's constantly being broken into by the interposition of certain common values. This is, roughly speaking, what occurs when people think the Marxists have gone too far, or communism has gone too far, Lenin has gone too far, Stalin has gone too far. Too far for what? Too far, usually, for some kind of common human values which we share, to some extent, with the other side, which, in theory, should not be admitted. Now, let me go back a little to history. The great heretic of the Marxist movement 
was, of course, Edward Bernstein in the late 19th, early 20th century, this famous revisionism. Now, what was Bernstein's real crime? Of course, among his real crimes were, was the fact that he said that most of the Marxist prophecies didn't come true. That he said that whereas Marx said that uh, wages would fall, they were both relatively and absolutely rising. He said that land would be concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, they were not. And other points of a similar kind. But his real crime, or this I think could have been got over. One could have argued that he'd got the facts, that this was a temporary phase, or that he had made mistakes about the facts. Something could have been done to remedy that. What was really wrong with his whole attitude was, was of a more far-reaching kind. What Bernstein was really saying was something which was fundamentally true and concealed a profound contradiction in the whole, so to speak, Marxist approach, which had important and interesting consequences in the 19th century, and as well as the 20th, on a practical, even more than on a theoretical plane, and that is this. One of Marxist doctrines was that uh, the party must, there must be a, a political party of the proletariat. They mustn't desist from political action, as syndicalists recommended, lest they be corrupted by bourgeois values. The only way to bring about uh, the revolution, to create a situation in which uh, the proletariat could, in the end, win power, was by participating in the political life of the particular countries to which they belonged, and uh, to uh, create mass parties instead of indulging in idle conspiracies of the 1848-1851 type. Very well. Now, if you do that, if you have a mass party and you actually form and you um, take part in the political life of the people around you, then what happens is I think that you insensibly and inevitably, certainly, become identified to some extent, at any rate, uh, become mixed up with the general life of the people with whom you are forced to collaborate in parliaments, in municipal councils, in the general conduct of life. This is inevitable for human beings in general. So long as you believe in the self-insulation of a conspiratorial sect, early Christians or Blanquists, who say, these people are doomed, they are done for, they are all corrupt, they are all wicked, we shall have nothing to do with them. We insulate ourselves, we are a community of saints. We work entirely within our own premises, so to speak. We have as little communication with them as possible. We are the party of the future. So long as you confine yourself to small, bitter, organized conspiracies, such as Katroff, for example, recommended, and Lenin, to some extent, uh, implemented. So long as you do that, this attitude is possible. But if you believe in mass parties, if you believe in partic participating in political life, particularly in democracies, but really in any country which allows you to do that, if you do that, then inevitably you eat with them and you drink with them and you speak to them and you follow their rules and to some extent you become identified with our whole form of life. In which case their values are to some extent overlap with yours. This is precisely what Bernstein simply noted. Noted simply as a fact. And of course there was a moral implication behind it. He simply took up Engels' position who said in the 90s, 18, he said 1891 is not 1848, our position is quite different. We are able by legal means, we conspirators, we subversives, are able by legal means, namely by voting in German elections, to obtain far more than we were able to obtain by illegal means. Legal means help us more. Well, all that Bernstein was noting was that the German marvelous German Social Democratic Party, by organizing itself in the magnificently disciplined way in which it was, by developing its own social services, health services, educational services, political services, everything, whatever, by creating a splendid, unified, disciplined, typically German organization, by doing this, uh, was enabled to march forward, not merely to improve its own position, but to set a model to others, and in a certain sense, to embody the most progressive tendencies of the society of that, of, of that time. In, and in that sense, of course, to acquire allies among the sympathetic bourgeoisie, to become, in short, integrated into the normal political life of the country, which they could painlessly and gradually lead into some kind of uh, democratic socialism. Now, this, of course, was a real, uh, so to speak, profound heresy. This really was a heresy of principle, not just of periphery, of, of the center, because it meant their values and our values overlap. It is possible to live in peace with them. It is possible to some extent to collaborate with them. It is possible to live a common life with them. But of course, if we have a political party, if we have a mass party, this is inevitable. It's extremely, the, the Marxist recipe, which is, you create a party which collaborates with the bourgeoisie to a certain degree, and while you are weak, puts them in the saddle, but having put them in the saddle, then proceeds to harry them until it finally ousts them. The whole Marxist theory of what might be called the expanding Trojan horse, the Marxist theory of what you might also call, sort of speak, a sort of kind of cuckoo in the nest politics, 
by which you, you, the, the proletarian cuckoo is warmed in the nest of capitalism while it is still weak, and as soon as it acquires sufficient strength, proceeds then to dispatch those who, against their own wills and by historical necessity, have in fact nurtured it. This particular theory doesn't work, may work with a conspiracy, but obviously doesn't work with a mass party of a political kind. During this conference, people talked about a certain subculture which the German Social Democrats developed in Germany and somewhat condemned those Social Democratic leaders for insulating their people to some degree from the common life of their country. My thesis is the opposite. By creating a mass party, by following Marx's advice, in a certain sense, they produced the opposite result. They integrated the German Social Democracy into the life of the country. For better or for worse, that is not uh, the point of which I'm concerned at the present. And so you get Bernstein in, in implying that there is a certain common moral life and a certain common political life, a certain common social life to these workers and the people who surround them. And this was obviously true about the West in general. And if you ask, why was Marx so profoundly mistaken? Why, having prophesied revolutions in developed industrial countries, which according to his doctrine should have occurred, say in England, say in the United States, possibly in Holland. Why did they in fact occur in quite a different set of countries, in, in Russia or in Spain or in China or in Africa or wherever it may be? Why did this happen? It is precisely because he united two incompatible things. On the one hand, the sheep and goats theory, we versus they, either we or they, which will only do for self-insulating conspiracies which really can build ghetto walls around themselves and nurture themselves upon their own hopes and their own strength, so to speak, and keep out the uh, contaminating elements without. He combined that with the need for a political party and a mass movement which inevitably penetrates the general social life of a country. These two things couldn't, in fact, in practice, be combined. And that is why, curiously enough, this extraordinary historical paradox occurred by which the despised Bakunin, the romantic anarchist, the man who never really understood doctrine, the Mohammed without a Quran, as Marx called him, and had a right to call him because the, one of the points of Marx was that he did provide a Quran for his particular movement, and this Quran played an enormous part. This Mohammed without a Quran proved to be prophetically right, and Marx, to a certain degree, proved to be mistaken. Bakunin's doctrine, which is a comparatively simple one, was roughly this and of course partly the doctrine of the syndicalists as well, if you have an industrially developed society and you have in it a competent party led by sophisticated intellectuals, what he called uh, rather unkindly pedantocracy, and you have um, a, a party of persons um, who, so to speak, um, use the latest techniques of industrial civilization, then you will breed a class, by the very competence of your arrangements, because you will create an efficient social democratic party. And you will raise this level of existence by successful strikes, by successful organization, by using all the implements of a mounting industrial civilization for your benefit. You will create a class which will gradually begin to acquire a certain vested interest in the continuation of the society of which they are a part. The only people who really can make the kind of revolution that is desirable, namely something which really will destroy the whole bad old world and bring a new world on its ruins and not simply modify it in trivial respects. The only people who can do that are people who have no vested interest in the old. And these people must be people who have nothing to lose. Landless peasants, lumpen proletariat, desperados of various sorts. This may have gone too far, but the, the, doctrinally, Bakunin proved to be right because the countries in which these revolutions really did break out were countries where, in a certain sense, so to speak, this was far truer than in the countries about which Marx prophesied it. And that is the interesting sense, sense in which Marx powerfully impressed the imagination of the 19th century with the doctrine of we or they, with the doctrine of sheep and goats, with the doctrine of non-communication between different classes, and at the same time gave tactical and strategic advice which in a certain sense nullified this. Let me put it in another way. Marx says that the capitalists are the grave diggers of their own system, that by, their very, uh, by following so to speak, the natural lines of higher and higher productive efficiency and centralization, they create a situation in which the proletariat is trained by these very methods to take over power comparatively painlessly. To some degree, the opposite occurred. That is to say, what happened was that Marxism dug its own grave, at any rate in the West, to some degree. It dug its own grave because the more, the better the workers were organized, the shrewder they were, the more they heeded Marx's advice, 
the more they politically organize themselves, the more they press the capitalists, the more concessions they obtained, the more they wedged themselves into society, the stronger they became, and therefore the more comfortable they became. This is precisely what the syndicalists had always warned them about. By becoming stronger, they became more wedded to the particular societies out of which they extorted these particular concessions. The only real revolutions occurred in societies where these concessions were not given them. In Russia, where there was no great proletariat, where the ruling class really was caught in its own contradictions, because it was semi-feudal, because it was stupid, because it realized that whether it made concessions or whether it stuck to its guns, it was likely that that particular system would soon be broken in any case by the advance of production and so forth. And that is why, curiously enough, this paradox turned in upon Marxism itself. The more successful Marxists were, the further away the revolution in the countries in which they used those advanced techniques which had been urged upon them by Marx. Let me say this. Marx was a very remarkable prophet. Far be it from me to deny this. In the 19th century, his prophecies really were of an astonishing depth and, and, and extent. He prophesied, he saw the development of big business before others, other persons had done so. He understood extremely well the contradictions between uh, what might be called um, um, collectivized production and individualized distribution. He understood this. He understood the degree to which human beings are transformed by the very productive processes in which they take part. The self-transformation of human beings, which has certainly not been noticed so far in the past. He was extremely brilliant and, 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 and effective in explaining what he meant by the fetishism of commodities, in explaining what he meant by the fact that human beings assume all kinds of laws to be eternal laws like the laws of nature, laws of economics, laws of sociology, various other forms of bourgeois morality which are in fact the work of human hands and disappear when the classes which profit by them themselves disappear. All this is very remarkable and do not let me derogate from the depth or importance of his genius. But there are certainly two things which he failed to perceive. One is the flexibility, these are very commonplace points, but I think I must make them. One is the flexibility of the capitalist system. That, so to speak, the assumption was that the capitalist system would be a stone wall which couldn't be penetrated. This, in fact, didn't occur. It was penetrated. Uh, the more the workers pressed, uh, the more the system gave. There is no doubt that he vastly exaggerated both the power and the obstinacy of tycoons and military commanders. By, b b b in fact, I mean, the, the kind of social policies which we associate with various kinds of welfare state activities, all the Lloyd Georges and the Roosevelts and the Keynes of the world, created a situation in which, in fact, a great deal of the accumulated violence of the contradictions which Marx prophesied, uh, in fact, were to some degree, anyhow, alleviated and resolved. You may say, as some Marxists try and say, that all Marx was saying was that unless these people yielded, unless the bourgeoisie was wise, uh, these various crises which he um, predicted would occur. But this is, I think, not so. He was, he was predicting them absolutely. He wasn't merely saying, you must be careful. If the bourgeoisie is stupid enough, it'll get itself into these various tangles. He was sure that it would because it couldn't be unstupid enough, because it was conditioned by history to be blind and deaf in certain ways. So that in a sense, if you like, Marxism created its own antibodies, a very odd form of dialectic by which Marxism, by its very success, created the flexibility and the elasticity on the part of its enemy, which made, it, which made a certain degree of coexistence possible. The second thing which I think he failed to perceive, and this is a very commonplace thing, but I think I must mention it, is the force of nationalism. Nationalism is, of course, the, according to Marxist theory, simply part of the superstructure, and itself is a form of self-delusion which disappears when the economic base to which it gives rise is itself superseded. I don't wish to go on too long, but uh, the, the whole history of the 19th century belies this. It's, I think it would almost be true to say, as somebody said, I can't remember who, that no movement in the 19th century succeeded without being an ally of nationalism, and no movement succeeded against it. In 1815, it killed German liberalism and cosmopolitanism of people like Humboldt and Goethe. In 1848, it was that which arose in the ashes of the revolutions of 48. It was the nationalism of the southern Slavs which killed the revolution uh, in, in, in Austria. It was Bismarck and Napoleon III who played upon nationalism to a violent extent who arose out of those particular ruins. In 1914, it was clear that whatever Marxist leaders might have thought, Bettmann Hollweg and the Kaiser were not afraid that the troops wouldn't march because they were all members of the German Social Democratic Party. 
because it is clear that nationalism was a powerful, independent motive, whatever else people might believe. Whether the Russian communism would have succeeded if nationalism had not been stimulated by the civil war and by intervention is not at all clear. Nor need I dwell unnecessarily upon the force of nationalism in China today or in Africa, everywhere else, so to speak, the new nationalisms which, to which ex-imperialism or anti-imperialism gives rise to. This, I think, was systematically discounted by Marx. One of the peculiar situations in Hungary was that it was genuinely not allowed for. A nationalist outburst was not allowed for because of over-addiction to Marxist theory. These two things then, the elasticity of capitalism and the independent force of nationalism, however it may have been bred, didn't enter into the Marxist picture. And to this extent, he proved a, 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 a somewhat purblind prophet. Nevertheless, the other things which I spoke of, the great monistic vision, the theory of the unity of theory and practice, the notion that there is a particular, so to speak, of the growth of the particular class, namely the proletariat, who, which, by the very nature of industrialization, by the very nature of the particular technical civilization in which we live, was bound to some extent to take over the productive apparatus. That, in fact, it was class struggles more than any other struggle which determined um, the course of history, whether they took the form of proletarians versus capitalists in a given state, or to some extent even the forms of, for example, men of different race and color who are nevertheless also penetrated by acute sense of difference of status, which ultimately reduces itself to class again. That particular insight, I think, he may be credited with. And he was certainly the only person who saw this. He was the only person who invented, who said he found a body of men to whom, on, upon whom he could impose it as their particular doctrine, and he wedded theory and practice in a manner which certainly nobody before him, and I shouldn't have thought anyone after him, had come anywhere near to doing. Thank you very much.